Hello and welcome to Lord of the Board. My name is Sam and today I am so, so excited because we are going to be returning to the Woodland of Root talking about its fourth expansion, the Homeland expansion. Just kind of a quick look at the journey of expansions that we've gotten for the game. First off, at release, the Riverfolk expansion came out, which came with the Riverfolk Company, the Lizard Cult, um, a way to kind of solo the game. Um, and three new Vagabonds, then kind of moving over to the Underworld expansion, which came with the Duchy, the Corvids, and two new maps, the Underworld and, uh, or sorry, the Mountain map and the Lake map, then kind of going over to the Marauder expansion, we got the Rats or the Lord of the Hundreds and the Keepers in Iron, um, better way to play the game at lower player counts with the Hirelings and also advanced setup, and now we've got this new expansion box, the Homeland expansion, this is going to come with Bats, frogs uh, and also two new maps so kind of the same framework as the underworld expansion however i would actually phrase this expansion to be more like the river folk box in terms of what these factions do and how they operate now before we dive in anymore i do want to note that this is prototype completely prototype components so uh these <laughs> these frog meeples and these bat meeples they were sent to me without faces on them and i actually went in and sharpied um an idea of what they actually do look like and i'll have a picture up and showing what the actual meeples will look like so you'll be able to see the official ones as well but hey i tried i tried okay <laughs> So we are going to start off by talking about the Lilypad Diaspora. Now the Lilypad Diaspora is a faction made up of frogs and toads, and they once belonged to the woodland, and they are trying now to reintegrate back to the woodland that they once called home. And the way that the game actually kind of shows this is that they have a couple of different components. They have these frog tokens, which have two states. They basically have an angry and a, uh, a happy side, but they're actually technically called peaceful and military. Militant. And they also have a deck of frog cards, which can be taken and, and given to other players in order to be used by them. And so kind of over the game, this kind of integration into the woodland really does get more and more real thematically and also mechanically. But let's kind of look about how that actually works. First, we'll start off kind of with the current Lilypad Diaspora abilities. The first one's going to be swimmers. They are the same as the Riverfolk Company and the fact that when moving, they will treat the rivers as paths, ignoring all rule. They've also got Frog Culture, which is the frog tokens that I discussed. The coolest thing about this, though, is that they actually count as frog suits and create a frog clearing when they are on the board. So for example, if you have a frog token on the board, it is actually gonna make that clearing count as a frog clearing as well as whatever clearing it is. Last one is protective, which says that at the start of battle as defender, you will flip any defending peaceful frog token to militant. And when an enemy removes a frog token, they must discard a frog card from their hand. Let us talk about why it matters that there are peaceful and that there are militant frog tokens. That is kind of the main pool of the Lilypad diaspora. This is how they really operate. They score points from peaceful tokens on the board. However, their militant side is actually linked to their capability to recruit onto the board. So they'll have a bigger presence, the more militancy that they have in the woodland. In Birdsong, players sharing a space with a militant frog token can reconcile with the Lilypad Diaspora by giving them a card. And in turn, they will be able to draw a frog card from the top of the Lilypad Diaspora's deck. This would also flip the token back to its peaceful side. The reprisal step is kind of crazy, which says that if there is a militant token and it is just left onto the board, so it wasn't reconciled by any, by any player, it essentially covers up that clearing and makes it only a frog clearing. So now it doesn't share, it's not a mouse and a frog, it's just a frog clearing. You can imagine the world in which this would be very difficult for factions like the Eerie Dynasty or maybe the Lizard Cult. There's there's going to be a lot of things like this really changes the, the, the depth of that forest and what it really means when you're friendly with the lily pads and, and not friendly. 
Daylight is pretty typical for them. They are able to craft with all their frog tokens. So right now at this current state, they're amazing crafters because they can get those frog tokens out really quickly and then just craft cards using them, similar to that of Woodland Alliance Sympathy. And then they have an ability called Anger or Soothe. So essentially they have to make a choice. Are they going to flip all peaceful frog tokens of one particular suit over to Militant or are they going to flip all militant frog tokens that they rule over to peaceful? And I think that is a very interesting choice because oftentimes you might only rule one or you may not have a lot of frog presence and you're like, well, I got to start getting some more frogs on the board. So I guess I'm going to flip all of my rabbit frog tokens over to militant in order to recruit this round. Then the next step in daylight is to place one warrior at each militant frog token. So like I said, they can burst onto the board really quickly, but it's it's kind of based on, well, how many points do I want to score? Because I'm not going to be scoring for those militant tokens. I'm going to be scoring for those peaceful tokens. And then in their fourth step in daylight, they are able to move or battle up to three times. Then we get to the evening, which is the time in which they can place new tokens on to the board. They can settle any number of times on their turn. They can either spend a card matching a clearing to place a, a frog token there, or if they rule a clearing, they can place a frog token there. And then we get to their scoring mechanism called integrate. This says that once for each fox, rabbit, and mouse, they may spend a card to score one point per peaceful frog token of a matching suit. So as you can see, their scoring can basically be all over the place. They might score one point, they might score three points, they might score five points, seven points. It's really gonna depend on how many peaceful tokens they have on the board. And really the, the, the reasons why I've been loving playing the, the Lilypad Diaspora is because they are a faction of balance. They definitely have two distinct states. One where, hey, I want to make friends in this woodland and one where, hey, I need to basically go around and start gaining ground with this faction because you guys aren't letting me exist and I need to have a foothold here in order to survive and claim my land back. And I love that you can be a distinct two different sides to this faction. They really do feel like a cool blend between insurgent and militant, definitely more leaning onto the militancy, but I, I see where you can clearly play kind of both sides, similar to that of, I would say, the Riverfolk Company who is able to really police the board, but also is mostly an insurgent faction. That is the Lilypad Diaspora, but we've got another faction to talk about today, and that is going to be the Twilight Council. Now, if you thought that changing the suit of clearings was crazy, well, the Twilight Council essentially adds a new way to battle in the game. And it's actually not battling at all. It's literally the opposite of battling. It's debating and dealing with problems a little bit more peacefully. Well, in their opinion. Now, the Twilight Council is the bat faction in the game, and essentially they are trying to present a new way to deal with the war going on in the woodland. Where the frogs are trying to reintegrate back into the woodland, the Twilight Council is trying to just stop the fighting. Say, hey, we need to stop all of this violence. This is not good for anybody. But in the meantime, they're still trying to win, so... That's an interesting take. But how are they actually gonna do this? They are going to be able to hold assemblies. They're gonna have what is called assembly tokens. And these assembly tokens essentially give an option to all the players at the table. It's going to allow you to win a faction would typically battle. They are allowed to instead hold an assembly. And it kind of works similar to that of a battle. You essentially will choose a faction at the assembly to be the defender. And then at that point, the defending player can concede. They will remove all defending warriors and then both players will draw a card and it will end the action. It's just going to be done right there. 
However, if they don't concede, then you're gonna roll two dice. The attacker is going to be able to play a card that matches the clearing the assembly is being held. And if they played a card, they can re-roll the dice, either one or both. Then the defender can react by playing a card from their hand, although it does have to have a higher crafted cost than the card the attacker played, and then they can choose to re-roll one or both dice. Then the dice are going to remove pieces on both sides, just like a battle would, except that there's no warrior limit. So if you had one warrior in the clearing or even just one token in the clearing, no matter what the die shows, those hits are going to be dealt and both of those are going to be returned to the supply, still earning points for both factions if any tokens or buildings are removed. It's essentially a new battle action, which actually has more of a preference on card wealth, which everybody knows in this game, well, actually maybe not everybody knows, but the cards are the actual physical representation of the woodland itself. The different suits are all of the different suits on the board. And so when you are presenting a card during an assembly, what you're saying is you're bringing in that group and they're coming in and basically debating on your behalf, saying that, hey, no, this needs to happen this way. And when you get a counter move, that's the opposing faction essentially saying, hey, I've also brought some friends. I've also brought some people. So I'm going to kind of sway the conversation my way. In Birdsong, they're going to remove all assemblies with no council warriors. They can only craft with assemblies that they rule, so it is pretty hard for them to craft at times. During daylight, you are going to be revealing cards from your hand, Lizard Cult style. You're either going to be playing assemblies uh, in matching clearings with enemy pieces, or you're going to be placing council warriors at assemblies already placed. So then the evening portion starts and that's where most of their activity starts, which is an awesome little ode to them being bats, being nocturnal, doing all their actions at night, very fun. So the first thing is that they are going to be able to assemble once per assembly. They will basically flip the assembly to its active side and do an assemble action with it. Assemblies have an active side and a non-active side, and they are going to score for every active side at the end of their turns. So by assembling, sure, they're going to flip it, but they still have to worry about potentially losing that token in this assembly unless it's properly guarded by council warriors. Then once you're done deciding whether you're going to assemble with all of your assemblies, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to look at the revealed cards that you played. Um, and you're gonna look at what suits they are, and you're also gonna look at any active assemblies that you have on the board, any of those that you flipped, and you're gonna look at this hand of edict cards. Now, these edict cards are very interesting, very different, and pretty powerful depending on the circumstances. I found them to be very good. But essentially, you're gonna look at those revealed cards, and for every suit that you have revealed, you can basically spend one to put one of these edicts in play, and for every active assembly you have, that can also count towards it. One of my favorite ones is the three bunny edict, which says that your enemies cannot concede when you assemble with them, which means that if there is an opponent with just a stray token, instead of them just being like, ah, I concede and they just completely bypass the, the harm of having their warriors removed because there was none there to begin with and they get to draw a card. Now you can get those tokens cleaned up, which is really awesome. And if you're afraid of actually assembling with, let's say a stray assembly token with nothing to defend it, but you still want to score it. Having this four Fox cost edict card is awesome because it says that when scoring any number of times, you can actually flip an assembly to its active side by spending a matching revealed card. So these edicts are absolutely crazy and playing out these certain cards is also what you got to think about to get these edicts in play. But these edicts are not going to apply typically until your next round. So there is definitely some puzzling thinking going on there. The next step is that you're going to be scoring one point per active assembly on the board and then you're going to be flipping all active assemblies to inactive. Then you're going to discard all your revealed cards and draw one for every card discarded plus one. So if I revealed three cards, I'm going to discard all of them, draw four cards. And then next round, if I you know revealed four cards, I would draw five cards. So it can expand. It just depends on how many cards you're actually revealing. What I love about the Twilight Council is that this new assembling uh, rule, this new ability 
it applies to everyone. Two factions, not even with the bat there, could choose to assemble with each other as long as an assembly is in place. That conceding ability is one thing that I find very fun because there is a lot of situations where there's a stray token on the board and a faction could just concede in order to decide with the Twilight Council that they both want to draw a card. And you can kind of abuse this, but it's also like a cool little alliance thing. Like you guys can make that deal. Like that's up to you. That's up to you, the players. This to me feels like a love letter to the River Folk expansion because both of these factions change the game drastically. You've got the Twilight Council giving everybody an option to do an assembly action where they're able to debate instead of battle. And you've also got frog tokens which are now changing the dynamic of the board state where you're going to have you know, clearings that have frog and mouse, but then there's going to be clearings that are only frog and you're going to be able to gain these frog cards by reconciling with the lily pad diaspora and you're going to be able to use those frog cards against the frogs or for the frogs. There is so much interesting and fun dynamics and there are both very political factions. This both of these factions require a lot of table talk in my personal opinion, and also other players should be table talking with them as well. Uh, you guys already know, I, I am a huge fan of the table talk aspect of Root, so for me, this expansion feels like it was meant for me. I love Marauders, I love the militant factions, sure, but at the end of the day, Table talking is what I love most about Root, and both of these factions have given me an outlet to do that more with some mechanics. It is a blast. It's very, very fun, and I think Josh Yearsley is doing some great work here with where these factions are at. I'm so excited to see where they end up. But this expansion is not comprised of just factions. It also has two new maps. And the first one let's talk about is the Marsh and the Swamp map. Now, I was not sent this map, so I actually don't know firsthand how it feels to play. I do have some images that I'm showing that uh, I saw from Kyle that he revealed of the map. So this is what I know so far of its kind of vibe and general look. And if you're counting the clearings, yes, there is 15 clearings there. So what the swamp map or marsh map is setting out to do is expand the root board to potentially give players an option to play with a higher player count. Now, if you're one of the crazy people that have actually played a six player game of root, it's actually pretty fun. I know that people hate on it. I know that people are like, no, it's just too much. But honestly, what can I say? I like some wild craziness and I don't mind if it takes a long time. I just get really, really into it. We've played it before. We've enjoyed it before, I'll say, even on the small board. I think that this would help a lot though with that being even more interesting. And I am very excited to play. So this new map has that compatibility and I know that you can kind of take away clearings potentially in order to make it, you know, playable for a normal faction um, matchup. And that could also probably change up the way that the paths are laid out. So very excited to see more of that. Um, and maybe, you know, they might make it playable throughout the campaign. Who knows? But the last map that actually comes with the expansion is my map, the Gorge map. The one that I designed and I am honored and humbled that this is a reality. So yes, I'm a part of the new expansion in a small way. I was able to design the map and sure, it's not going to look the exact same. Kyle Farron is going to do his amazing art overhaul on the one that I did and I cannot wait to see that. Um, and also there might be mechanical changes, um, and probably some usability changes. I am just so stoked that this map's going to be in the game. I set out to just make a map, just a basic, interesting layout with some really rude choke points and some really interesting, uh, ways to make players interact with each other. And that is what the Gorge map is all about. However, I've actually already talked about this, so I'm going to go ahead and link my video on it right up here. If you really want to hear more about the Gorge map and what it entails and you haven't watched that video already. So go ahead and check that out. 
But if you are interested in picking up the expansion for yourself, definitely go down below. I have a link to the campaign page right down there. So definitely check that out. But hey, that is it for the Homeland expansion. That's the most fitting name for the expansion because genuinely I feel like I'm returning back home when I am able to talk about Root and new Root stuff to you guys. So thanks so much for watching. And with that, let us go ahead and drop the beat.